Real quick, I have a quiz for you. What did the tomato say to the bacon? Yes, let us get together. One of the great inventions, BLTs. I tell Melinda that summer is not summer without one of those. In the light of the events that happened last weekend, um, I'm deviating from our study in the book of Proverbs. Uh, there are times when things happen that, honestly, I'm at a loss for words. But I'm thankful that God's word is faithful and that God's word always can speak to us and address uh, whatever situation we find ourselves in. For any that might be in doubt, I want to be very, very clear this morning Racism is not a social issue. It is not a political issue. It is a biblical issue. It is a spiritual issue. It is a moral issue. And the Word of God addresses it, and rightfully so. And I uh, felt that it was important that we address it in a timely manner and that we look to the Word of God to give us a per perspective, a framework on which uh, we look at one another and deal with one another uh, to the glory of God and to his honor. And so I'd ask uh, you to pray with me before we share God's word this morning. Please bow with me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you that you love us all. That you made that very clear through your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly came to earth, died once for all, for all people, for all time. And Lord God, I pray that as your people, that we would be light to this world, that we would share the love that you have for all of us, that we would be ministers of peace, and that we would proclaim the truth. And Father, I just ask that as we look at your word this morning, that if there is anything that is revealed here this morning that is out of line with our own thinking, our own actions, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would convict, that you would correct, that you would also challenge us and encourage us to be active participants in advancing your kingdom. As Zach and Rachel sang, there is work to be done. And so, Lord, uh, help us to be your agents, tools in your hand. We pray these things in the powerful and loving name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Um, through uh, this past week, I was taken back uh, decades ago to a time in which I was in typing class in high school. Now, for all the young people in the room, you're not going to be able to relate to this because you've grown up with keyboards on computers. Uh, but there was a time back when old people had to learn how to type and had to take a class in which you learned where to keep your fingers and what fingers to move where to hit the certain keys, and you had what they called time test in which the teacher would give you a certain thing that you were to type, and you typed as much as you could within a minute, and then you were handed that in, and you were graded upon it based upon how many words a minute you typed and the accuracy. In other words, how many mistakes you made. And that kept rolling around in my head this week because my typing teacher, one of the first sentences my typing teacher gave us to do a time test we had to type this over and over and over again was the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing and that kind of plagued me and kept swirling around in my mind this past week that evil triumphs if good people remain silent evil triumphs if good people don't stand up and say the right thing and do the right thing. Evil triumphs if good people, by their silence, are complicit with the evil that goes on. And so I really felt it was important that we look at this from the Word of God. And so we're going to kind of jump around in passages throughout the Word of God because the Word of God is uniform in its uh, position and declaration 
about race. And the very first thing that I want us to uh, know and to be reinforced from God's word is that there is one race. It's the human race, just one. Uh, we read in the creation story that uh, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And we are made to be image bearers of God, and we reflect the, the we're at our best, reflect the nature and character of God uh, to the glory of God. I included another passage because this other passage I think is really important. It's after the flood, after Noah and his, uh, his wife and his three sons and their wives are coming out of, of the, the boat. And it, it tells us that he had those three sons and these were the three sons of Noah. And from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Well, Pastor, why are you telling us that? We know, we know that story. Well, it's kind of important because what God has given us through the creation story and again through the judgment, through the flood, and Noah and his family is something very unique within the ancient culture of the Old Testament times because the Mesopotamians and other pagan cultures, they had a totally different creation myth and I say myth on their behalf, um, because they, their teachings were that they were created first and then other people were created, therefore making them ontologically superior to other people because they were created first. And the message that God has and the story that God has through the people of God is, no, we're all one people. Nobody has the right to think they're superior over another. And in fact, the, the uniqueness of Israel is that God even declared to Israel, I chose you not because you were a mighty nation, but, be, but because you were a small nation. Because you, you, he, 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 he chose and made a selection out of mercy and grace. And so first and foremost, we're one race. And out of that, the very next thing, and I've already alluded to it, is that there is no group of people superior to another. The Apostle Paul reinforces this truth when he is in Athens on Mars Hill, when he is uh, preaching and looking to persuade uh, those Greek thinkers uh, because uh, they indeed did think they were superior to others. And he's looking at all these statues there of uh, all of these uh, statues made to other gods. And he reinforces the Old Testament understanding when he says, from one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So he's describing a group, all, all peoples, and he goes on and then points them to this one from heaven who came and who gave his life and rose again for everyone. The epitaph on a granite base in a statue in England, the town of Bedford simply says, no white person has done more for South America than Trevor Tuttleston. Those words were the words of Nelson Mandela. He tells about, as they refer to him, as Father Trevor, who uh, lived in Sophia Town, South Africa, he says, I'm sure that he would not have wanted to be referred to as a white man. But he said it was most appropriate, rather than speaking about no English person or no Christian person, for Nelson Mandela said, to be in South Africa and to grow up in South Africa, the color of your skin defined who you were, the color of your skin determined where you could live. The color of your skin determined what you were allowed to do. 
And it was fundamentally important to Father Trevor the fact that he was white and how he interacted with other people. And Nelson Mandela in his autobiography describes how he was nine years old and he was on the steps of the Institute for the Blind where his mother worked uh, as uh, one who cleaned the building. And he said, uh, this man came out of the building one day dressed up in a suit and a hat and as he's coming out and he saw Nelson Mandela and his mother, this man tipped his hat to Nelson Mandela's mother. And he said at nine years of age, he said that was a defining moment for him because he was overwhelmed. This man did the unimaginable for he acknowledged with dignity Nelson Mandela's mother. And he said, I saw that possibilities for what could happen because of a simple act like that on behalf of uh, that clergyman. He said he later came to know that what he did at, at that moment was completely consistent with his theology because his theology included the understanding that every single person is significant and has infinite value because they are created in the image of God. The next thing that we need to reinforce and understand from the, the biblical teaching is that racism is the antithesis of the gospel message. It is a message from hell. It is an agent of Satan. Satan wishes to destroy us, and uh, racism is a way of dividing and humiliating people. In uh, the Apostle Paul's encounter uh, with uh, the church in Antioch, in, where we read in Galatians, uh, there, there was a false teaching that was occurring. And, and, and in fact, uh, some of the Jewish believers didn't think that Gentiles could actually be saved. Interestingly enough, uh, within this own nation, there was false teaching in churches that minorities couldn't actually convert. But that, that happened early on in the church. And the Apostle Paul, uh, he, 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 uh, he's been with the church, and, and Peter comes to see because the church in Jerusalem wants to know more about what's going on in the church there. And he's assured them they truly are believers. They've received the Holy Spirit. And Peter comes and he's fellowship with them. He's eating with them. That means he's eating non-kosher food. He's, he's living like a Gentile. And then when these Judaizers, these false teachers come, and, and they're basically saying, can't be a Christian without first being a Jew, Peter withdraws from the Gentiles. And, and so much so that it says even Barnabas was taken into this. And when Paul saw this, he sees it as an affront against the gospel, a false gospel. Because the true gospel is that Jesus came for everyone. And he says, that, and when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that is Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? See, he's, he's making it really clear that the gospel is for everyone. Why is that important in race relations? because it makes it really clear that every single person has value to the living God. Only people judge other people based upon what they look like. God made us exactly the way we are. And he chose for us to be the way we are. Next, God's kingdom is made up of all people groups, all people groups. We studied the uh, book of Revelation last year, 
And uh, there are two occurrences in the book of Revelation in which the Apostle John gets a glimpse of a worship service going on in, in heaven. And, it, 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 and it's awesome. It's, it's very moving. And John's account is uh, that they are singing and rejoicing a new song. And he says, and this is what they sing. You are worthy, speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. It was 1988 when Melinda and I were participating in a Thanksgiving service. It's the closest thing to heaven I've ever experienced. I was in my last year of seminary. I had been working and doing my internship in a Haitian church in Chicago. Uh, the pastor was from Haiti. I worked with the youth, and he worked with all the adults. And because of my year in Haiti, um, I understood the culture, a little bit of the language, and it was just a blessing for me to work in that mission church. And on Thanksgiving, or not Thanksgiving, but the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, of that year, we had a joint worship service. We met in the Anglo church, but the Haitian church was there, the Hispanic church, and a bunch of other different ethnic groups and languages. And I can remember being very, very moved when we unitedly stood up and sang the words of a former Slave trader, John Newton's words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But they weren't just sung in English. They were sung in Creole. They were sung in Spanish. You could look across that sanctuary, and it was blanketed with all the beauty of the different colors and variations of what God had created in humanity. And in the heart of what we see and a glimpse of heaven is the heart of God for all people. And we as his people need to proclaim that, live that, shout it out with joy. Along with that is the truth that Jesus Christ creates one people. That's what he accomplishes through his blood and our surrender to his life, to our lives to his. In, um, in Ephesians we read, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. You see, here's the truth of the matter. Through our own sin and brokenness, we have a severed relationship with God we have a severed relationship with one another, and we even have a severed relationship within ourselves. And Jesus Christ came to reconcile us, to bring peace, to break down the walls of hostility between us and God, to break down the walls of hostility between us and each other, and to make one people rightfully in fellowship with him as Adam and Eve originally were within paradise. And consequentially, based upon that, Jesus in turn gives us a ministry of reconciliation. He says, it says in 2 Corinthians, Paul addresses this, so from now on we regard one another, no one from a worldly point of view, Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone 
is in Christ. He is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, and we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. See, we have a ministry. We have a call. We have a role and a responsibility in this world to call others to be reconciled to God and therefore reconciled to one another. To actually be able to live harmoniously with one another. And of all places and of all people groups, the church ought to be first and foremost on that front. Which brings me to my final point, and that is that Jesus calls us to be good neighbors. There's an account in the Gospel of uh, Luke where a man comes to Jesus and he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what do the scriptures say? How do you read it? And the man quoted exactly what we read for our call to worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you're absolutely right. You're on track. You got it. And then the Bible tells us, it gives us an insight into the man's heart. And it says, in order to justify himself, he asked, who is my neighbor? In other words, he wanted to know the loophole. He wanted to know who he didn't have to treat as a neighbor, who he didn't have to show love to. What was the exemption clause? And Jesus tells a story, a story that's become so popular that... Uh, when you hear the word Samaritan, I mean, even in our culture, there's a law, the Samaritan law, so that if you help somebody that's injured, you can't be sued because you were trying to do something good. Jesus tells this story. He says, there was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on his way, he was attacked by robbers. He was stripped, he was uh, robbed, and he was left half dead. And it so happens that a priest comes by and he sees that man. Now remember, a priest. He's the representative of God to the people and the people to God. And he sees him and he walks on by. And then a Levite comes by and sees that same man. A Levite was a worship leader, also responsible to represent God. And he walks on by. And then a Samaritan came and he saw that man and he got oil out, and he, he tended to his wounds, and he bandaged him up, and he put him on his donkey, and he took him to an inn, and he paid for the man's stay and told the innkeeper, if he needs anything else, when I come back to town, I'll settle with you. I'll pay his whole bill. And Jesus simply asked a simple question. Who was the good neighbor in that story? And the man said, the one who minister to him. Now, something that we often don't catch in that story is who Jesus chose to be the hero in the story. It's a Samaritan. The Jews can, can considered Samaritans half-breeds. They had married outside the faith. They had married outside uh, their, their line in Israel. The Jews often refer to Samaritans as dogs. And Jesus chose that character to be the hero in that story to say, no exceptions to who your neighbor is. If you're going to love God, you need to love your neighbor. And Jesus simply responded once the man identified who it was that truly was a neighbor. He said, 
go and do likewise. That's your call to go and be a good neighbor. Now, I need to make a word of exclamation or uh, ex explanation before we sing this last hymn. Because some of you may think, Pastor just totally lost his mind because this is August. And no, it's not that I'm longing for Christmas nor counting down the days nor uh, do I long for snow or winter because actually I prefer summer weather. But this song kept playing in my head all this week. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Um, because of its message, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, he was a great writer in, uh, in our nation, and he received word December 4th, 19, uh, 1863, that his son had been severely wounded. His eldest son had uh, slipped away uh, one day and got on a train and gone to Washington, D.C. and enlisted in the Union Army. And so now his eldest son, he had already lost his wife the year prior in a tragic fire. His eldest son is severely ill. And uh, he was told initially that the wounds would cause his death. Other doctors said he, he may recover. And so he wrote this poem that became this hymn on Christmas of 1863. He's 57 years old, widowed, one son in a military hospital and five children to care for. And he heard the bells from the churches call people out to come and worship on Christmas morning. And he thought, those bells are ringing about peace on earth, goodwill to men, but I don't see any peace. I don't see any hope. But as we'll sing through this whole hymn, you find that as he continued to listen to the bells, he came to the conclusion that right will prevail, that God will conquer that he will set things right. This church doesn't have a belfry. Lots of churches don't have belfries anymore. And so this is what I want to tell all of you, and I'm telling to myself this morning. When we sing this hymn, this is the commission. You're to be the bells. You're to ring out peace. You're to ring out love. You're to ring out the truth that God made everybody in his image. And that we are to be good neighbors who love and care for one another. And I would say, let's ring it out loud. Let's be bold about it. Let's be confident in what God has called us to be and do. So that if there are any out there that are right now, and I believe there are, that are like Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow, who are doubting whether that's possible, let's give them a glimpse of heaven. Let's give them some hope in Jesus. Would you bow with me in prayer? Oh, Lord Jesus. All we have to do is look around in this world and we are continually reminded that we sure do make a mess of things. But we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you came to save us, to instill within us hope and love and promise for a better future and that you have called and commissioned us to be your agents, vessels to be used to declare the good news, the gospel, and a God in heaven that delights in us. 
And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in living that out, in being good neighbors. And Father God, I pray for any and all here this morning who have yet to make that decision to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that they might be called to faith in Him, that they might hear His words of love and forgiveness and surrender themselves. I pray for my brothers and sisters, and I pray that you would help us, Lord, just to be faithful to you and make your love shine. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing this beautiful hymn, I invite you, if God has prompted you to uh, give your life to the Lord, it would be my honor to pray with you. Maybe God's calling you to join this church family or recommit your life to him. You feel free to respond. If you need to just come down and pray, you can do so, and there'll be people that will be here to pray with you. Let's stand and sing together. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. <laughs>